Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jennifer Tillman, and I want to first thank everyone for uh, coming to our seminar series. Today, we will be speaking on coping strategies for uh, any loved one that you may have with dementia. And we will be hearing from Dr. Flavia Walton. So I first want to, again, say welcome to our seminar series today. And uh, my name is Jennifer Tillman. I am the owner of Keller Williams, uh, the Tillman team of Keller Williams. I'm a real estate agent who focuses on seniors, caregivers, children with adult parents, uh, the baby boomers. I focus in that area, although I see myself as a uh, transition, transition specialist. So anyone in a transition, I love to help. I also have a coaching business, Inspiring Transformation, where I do uh, different types of, of life coaching, transformational coaching. Um, it could be grief. It could be downsizing, right sizing for where you are in your life. And also I've served on the Prince George's Senior Provider Network. The last three years has been uh, as president of Prince George's Senior Provider Network. And um, this year, starting this year, I'm a member of the board uh, over the membership committee. One of the things that I started is in Prince George's um, Senior Provider Network, we do lots of education to each other. Um, other people who also serve seniors in Prince George's County. And I wanted to bring that information to the community, to the seniors and to the caregivers. Um, so in uh, PGSPN, we have a yearly caregivers retreat. And some of the things that go on in that retreat, we never have enough uh, spaces for everyone who wants to come. So I figured it'd be great to do a seminar series. So I've started a Facebook page. And if you wanna to push to that, it's called Caring for the Caregivers in Prince George's County. And when you join this Facebook page, you will know about all of the seminars that are coming up, as well as information that's happening in our community. For instance, one of the things that's happening tomorrow is a caregivers, for the male caregivers, there's a in-person, uh, seminar for male caregivers. And any information that you are looking to have, um, if you could just put that information in the chat, any questions you might have, um, how you get uh, you know, connected to some of these things, and we will definitely get back to you. The next slide shows our um, resource guide, our 2024 resource guide. Again, the guide has just been uh, put out there in the community. And if you would like a copy of this resource guide, I can direct you to our website where you can get it online. Or if you put that information that you would like a hard copy, we would make sure that you get a hard copy of that as well. So without further ado, I want to really introduce you to our speaker today, Dr. Flavia uh, Walton, and I am going to read her bio. Again, as we start this um, presentation today, if you have questions, um, put them in the chat. Um, our admin is going to make sure that we don't miss any questions. And again, I'm so happy for you guys to be with us today for this very important topic. So Dr. Flavia Walton has spent most of her career identifying and mobilizing resources to build human and community capacity to improve education, health, and economic outcomes for individuals and organizations. Leadership positions in professional and volunteer organizations position Dr. Walton to work with elected local, state, and national officials to network and mobilize community groups and institutions to garner support and advocacy for the most vulnerable individuals and their families. I know that was a lot, but it, it meant a lot because you have done so much for our community. And so I give you Dr. Walton and here she is with her presentation today. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's always a delight 
to share information um, about this disease that is really overtaking our communities. Um, I have a vested interest in this disease because I cared for my father the last five years of his life and he was living with Alzheimer's. Um, also my mother-in-law lived with Alzheimer's. Um, I had a great aunt um, that had Lewy body dementia. So this is not a new topic for me and it's one that is near and dear to my heart. Um, it's also something that has made me even more resolute than ever and more intentional about what I do in the community regarding Alzheimer's because a recent report from the Alzheimer's Association identifies the state of Maryland as being one of the states with the highest prevalence and incidence of Alzheimer's in the country. And if you really dig down into the statistics of, well, of counties, Prince George's County is number two in the incidence and prevalence of Alzheimer's among counties in the whole country. The first three are tied for the number one spot and Prince George's County comes in, um, they have it third, but really, uh, if you look at the data really closely, we're really number two in the incidence and prevalence, which is very concerning. And it should be a real uh, red light flashing for everyone. Um, it's, it's concerning for our communities. It's concerning for the paucity of services that are available to serve uh, individuals, and um, we certainly need more people to become advocates and champions. Um, so, with that, um, that's my that's my commercial. Um, and I'd also like to to invite all of you to attend the uh, the men's caregiving event on Saturday. Um, Reginald Lawson, who is going to lead that discussion is a member of our South County team, and he has written a wonderful, wonderful book that has been very instructive for many people. Um, so I encourage you to attend that as well as a health fair on, um, on Saturday at Largo Community Church. And we will be doing health screenings and have information about uh, dementia at, at that event as well. That's from 12 until five on Saturday. And we will provide the information for both of those. Great, super, thank you. And next slide, please. And I'd like to start with this because I think that this really provides uh, a context of what I'm going to, to, to discuss with you today. Caregiving is one of the most noble yet often most understood jobs anyone can perform. It's hard emotionally, physically, and certainly one that is done either without monetary remuneration or for very little, or if any. For those caring for individuals with Alzheimer's, the job is even more challenging. In spite of the negatives, the rewards are many and can be one of the most rewarding jobs anyone can ever have. Effective coping strategies are central to a successful experience for the caregiver and for the person being cared for. So in this discussion today, I'm gonna to talk about some strategies in dealing with the person for whom you care, which is essential to your caring for yourself because the two have to be cared for in tandem and simultaneously. So we're gonna talk some about both. And I welcome questions, comments um, at the end of the presentation. Caring for someone with Alzheimer's is a challenging balancing act. The caregiver is responsible for their loved one's safety, comfort, medications, medical and other appointments, love and support, and everything in between. But your life matters too. It is just as important to keep up with your work, family and social life as it is for the care you give to your loved one. In your role as caregiver, do all that you can to be well-informed, prepared, and ask for help and support when you need it. Next slide. One of the first things to do is to know what to expect. Alzheimer's is different for everyone. There's no formula that will tell you things happen in, in this order, that order, and you know, you'll know you read everything about so stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, 
Well, it may start out at stage five and then go back to stage one. It may hopscotch around. It may go in that order. You never know what you might find from day to day with a person living with Alzheimer's. A person's condition can change often. Medication effects can vary. And we know that there are medications that are prescribed. Now, some work better than others. Some don't work at all. Some work for a period of time and then lose their effectiveness. But we're still looking for that cure and it has not been found yet, which leads to another issue about our lack of representation in clinical trials and in research for the caregiver as well as for the individuals living with the disease. Changes can make personal living with Alzheimer's seem demanding or dishonest. And for those of you who've been, been caregivers or are caregivers, I'm sure you've experienced this, being accused of something that has never happened, a memory about something that the way it's told is very different than the way that you remember it, being accused of stealing. As, as a spouse, you may have been accused of having an affair all kinds of things can happen. But over time, and you know that over time, symptoms will get worse because we know it's a progressive disease. And as I mentioned before, or alluded to, medications can slow down the disease, but it can't stop it. Next slide, please. Alzheimer's. Appearance versus reality. And this is something that all caregivers face. Caregiving for persons living with Alzheimer's requires different skills. You have to become imaginative, creative, and you're flying by the seat of your pants a lot of times. There are a lot of theories, there's a lot of help tips, but sometimes it's the spur of the moment kind of thing where you have to think of what can I do right now to stop a situation? What can I do to manage a situation? Uh, what can I do to prevent a situation? So you have to be ready to, to meet the moment, however it presents itself. But seeing a person in good physical health, but with cognitive issues can be devastating for caregivers. You're looking at your loved one across the table and they look as healthy as can be. But when you start talking with them or when you start observing their behavior, you know that something is missing. The person may look the same, but they're no longer the same. And this is something that's really, really hard for caregivers. And that is accepting the fact that the person that you love is no longer that same person. Maybe the appearance is the same, the body is the same, and sometimes the person you remember will emerge. But as the disease progresses, the person you remember disappears more and more. There can be a difference in appearance and reality faced daily by caregivers. And this is one of the things that, that tugs at your heartstrings probably more than anything else. Family and friends often lack the sympathy and understanding. They see this perfectly healthy person on the outside and don't understand the things that you're going through on a daily basis because there's no outward appearance of illness. There are no crutches, there are no bandages. Uh, there's nothing um, to indicate that a person is sick, quote unquote. So there's a lack of understanding because they're not there. People outside your inner circle may see no problems at all. Next slide. There's specific issues for caregivers, memory problems. You can no longer depend on your loved one's memory. And this can progress to their inability to care for themselves. Communication may be difficult or impossible. And you often have to guess at what a person wants. Behavior problems they have trouble self-regulating and may become violent or dangerous to a caregiver or to themselves. Next slide, please. And these are things to do for the caregiver. Research persons, your, your loved one's condition uh, and, and also try to find out what kinds of specific caregiving strategies are out there. 
don't always rely on your instinct. Have some have some other knowledge, but often you will have to to rely on your instinct. But let your instinct be based somehow in in some some known experience or best practices. Create a calm environment. Feelings of safety and comfort are important. Limit distractions. And just think about, and that's for you as well. When you are intent on caring for somebody, that's where your attention is. And distractions can impede your ability to be the best caregiver that you can be. Stay organized. A lack of organization can be stressful for you and for the one for whom you're providing care. Keep things uncluttered and labeled. Also, clutter can be dangerous. Dangerous for you and dangerous for the care for the person for whom you're caring. Okay, next slide. Create a schedule. Routine is important and reduces confusion and chaos. Be flexible and be open to change. Uh, be open to adapting to change. Meet the person where they are and do not be too rigid to change what no longer works. You may have a routine and things have been going along very smoothly and they have worked for quite a while. And then suddenly one day they don't work anymore. So don't try to just keep doing that thing over and over and over, hoping that it may happen again. You may have to change on the spur of the moment um, because again, you can never anticipate what may happen uh, with a person living with Alzheimer's. But whatever you do, keep it simple. Keep your language basic and request simple. There's an exercise that we have folks do. Um, and for those of you who've been through the uh, Dementia Friends information session, I think you probably remember where you're given task and you have to break it down into steps. And even the simplest thing that you do, the simplest routine thing that you do, like brushing your teeth, combing your hair, is comprised of many, many, many steps. And when you start barking these steps or repeating these steps or giving instructions and, and going through every step involved in something, you lose the person and it can, and it can confuse them and be a trigger for aggressive behavior as well. But whatever response you get, if it's outside the norm or your expectation, remember, it's the disease, not the person. The person's behavior for whom you provide care will frustrate, anger, depress, and hurt you sometimes. That's natural. Don't blame. Remember, it's the disease. Oh, goodness. Uh, they, do, they do not remember what you said or did in your response, but they will remember how you made them feel. And I apologize for that error there. I went through this several times. Okay, next, please. Caring for a spouse with Alzheimer's has special issues. When your partner has Alzheimer's, your risk for mental and physical problems increases even more than for caregivers of other conditions. According to experts, caring for someone with Alzheimer's is more intense than other caregivers, than other caregiving. You spend more hours and more years of care. You're with that person generally 24 hours a day. Even if you're working or away from home for another reason, you're still the caregiver of that person. It's 24 seven. Caregiver stress is real and must be addressed while caring for a loved one. Studies indicate that the healthier and happier you are, the better you are able to help your partner with Alzheimer's. Being better informed about the disease, going to counseling yourself, and having a strong support system, like a, a uh, support group, lowers the chances of depression and decline in your health. These strategies are linked to being able to keep your partner home longer. Okay, And that's important as well, because we know 
Uh, the data shows us that as longer a person can remain in a familiar environment, the, the better they do. So helping your loved ones care for themselves, and this is a biggie. People with Alzheimer's may stop taking care of themselves or where they live. And that's often one of the first signs that you see. Their inability to, to take care of their grooming, um, they start dressing differently. Um, they're, if they were once a very meticulous housekeeper or whatever, you start to see a decline in that. You see a buildup of clutter, um, maybe laundry, those kinds of things, but you will you start to see a change. This can be a huge challenge if they live alone or they refuse help. If the change is sudden, try to figure out if the person is sick or depressed. Now, you know that if you are not feeling well, if you're sick, or if you're just feeling down and out, you may let the laundry pile up, or you may not dust that piece of furniture, or dishes may pile up in the sink. That's one thing. But if it starts to happen gradually and over time and continues to build and become worse, then that's a clue that there might be something else that's wrong. If there's a lack of care over a while, the caregiver may need to step in. If the person refuses, you may need to obtain help or find other living arrangements for that person. It may have gotten to the point where they need closer supervision and maybe in a safer um, and more controlled environment. Medications are no help with this kind of behavior. It won't, it won't change that. It changes perhaps, it slows down the progression of the disease, but it won't change this kind of behavior. If the help is refused, focus on changing things that could pose dangers. Uh, if they don't take their meds properly or don't take them at all, they're not eating or drinking, they have untreated injuries like cuts or sores, infestation of rodents or, or insects in their home, rotting food or garbage or smell in their home, these are all indications that help is needed. And if you are unable to provide it, then that is really a red flag for you to get someone or some ones to come in to help with the situation. But you have to manage these situations with care to avoid behavior upsets. Make sure they're comfortable and understand what you are doing. That's important. Next slide, please. When a person becomes aggressive, what can you do? Anger, aggressive behavior may have no observable reason. It usually starts in later stages of the disease. Unsure why it happens, but researchers think that it may be a symptom in itself of Alzheimer's disease, or it may be a reaction to confusion or frustration or all of the above. But remember, behavior is not intentional or on purpose. It's the disease. Next slide. Again, common triggers to understand. They may be confused from trying to understand complex instructions or, or even your stress uh, may make them become agitated uh, or become aggressive. Feeling like their space is invaded, like bathing or changing clothes, I know with my dad who became unable to really dress himself, when I had to help him, he became very agitated. And I, and I recognized that that was because he'd always been a very modest person. I cannot remember growing up ever seeing him without a bathrobe or whatever. I mean, he was always dressed. Um, and for somewhere in the recesses of his brain, was still working, the fact that his daughter was having to help him do this uh, triggered uh, some aggression, some, some embarrassment, all those kinds of things. So you have to try and think about what this might be that's creating this kind of behavior. 
noticing your stress or frustration. And I'm the first one to admit, caring for someone who is living with Alzheimer's is no easy feat. And often you do get frustrated and anger will bubble up. Uh, you, you're, you, often you feel like you're being robbed of your own time. You feel like, why is this happening? You know, why can't I do something about it? I mean, all kinds of feelings just start to, to uh, just become part of what you go through almost on a daily basis. But realize again, it's not the person, it's the disease and you've got to look for help. But how you feel, your, your loved one will pick up on. They will pick up on that. Because the one thing that we try and get over to folks is that it's not your behavior necessarily or what you say that they, re that they will remember, but they will remember how you make them feel because that's one of the last parts of the brain to go is that emotional, that feeling part. So just remember that if you take away nothing else, remember, well, there are two things. Remember it's, it's the, it's the disease, not them that's creating whatever is there. And also they will remember how you make them feel. Okay. Another trigger is being criticized or belittled. Again, how you make them feel. Feeling rushed because they can't manage all of this. And, and when they're being rushed, they can't put all the things together. Following a, an instruction, a simple instruction, may take them up to a minute to even process what you're saying if they're able to do it at all, if the disease has not progressed beyond that. So it takes time. You have to have time, patience, and, and break things down into very simple, simple instructions. Not being allowed to do something or to go someplace. And that, you know, that can make us a little agitated as well. But remember, they are living in a different place and time. They may have gone back to when they were a child. That may be where they are functioning now. They're always back in time. So if they are back in time, they're going to react the way that they would have reacted wherever, they, wherever their brain resides. So if they are back to being a child, that's how they're going to behave. They're back to their teenage years. Well, you remember the teenage years when we were told we couldn't do something. You know, we pout, we fuss, all that kind of stuff. But remember, um, try and figure out where they're, where they are functioning. What time period are they functioning in? And that will also give you some clues into how you respond to a person in meeting them where they are. And then they're also, and it, it's all related, having to do something that they don't want to do. Come on, mom, it's time to eat breakfast. I don't want to, I'm not moving. Often you'll get that. So that's another challenge for the caregiver. I'm gonna give you eggs, bacon, juice, toast for breakfast. I don't want that. I want ice cream for breakfast. A challenge. So maybe they get ice cream for breakfast if it's not contrary to their diets. And maybe you sneak the eggs and bacon in later on during the day. Again, it's that creativity and meeting the person where they are. And who said you had to have eggs and bacon for breakfast anyway? Who decided that? Okay. More common triggers to understand. Feeling threatened. Often there's this, this, this paranoia that often goes along with Alzheimer's. Confusion about what was happening. Again, the inability to process, process information, process situations, um, it's there and it's confusing. It can become agitating uh, and they, they'll lash out. Thinking something was happening that wasn't, 
and again, accusing you of things that are untrue, like stealing. And that's a very common one that you find, people who are living with Alzheimer's. They'll accuse their closest loved ones of stealing their money, stealing their clothes, stealing their food. My dad didn't accuse anyone of stealing, but he always thought somebody was having a party in the house. And it was just the three of us, my husband, my dad, and me. But this was part of his, how his brain was functioning. Um, and that was, you know, stop the noise, stop the noise. Well, later figured out it was a TV that he was thinking was a party because he heard noise, but it was the, the lack of the ability to process had gone. Surroundings or routine changes could be a reason for aggression. In a no are they in a noisy room? Is there a lot of noise around them? Are they with a lot of people or people they don't know? Alcohol, caffeine, or drug use? Is there a change in their normal and their normal routine. All of these things you have to think about. Um, and the noise, especially noise, people that they don't know, and a lot of people can really be a trigger for aggressive behavior. Could the way their body feels be to blame? Are they in pain? Are they sick? Are they cold, too hot, hungry, thirsty, tired? or in need of a bathroom. Because again, they may be at the point in the disease where they're not able to express their needs for these for, uh, solutions to any of these issues. Ways to calm or keep your loved one calm. If you think you have an idea about how to do it, make a plan and try. If it doesn't work, try something else. Again, your creativity, is important in, in meeting a person where they are. If nothing works that you try, consult a professional for advice. If aggression caused uh, by contact with you or others, speak softly and be calm. Never try to argue with them. That'll just escalate. Never try to correct them. That will escalate. Try to comfort them, even if they try to resist. Be patient and understanding. And if you tell them they're wrong, again, it's just going to escalate the situation. Be clear about what you want them to do. For an example, let's sit in this chair instead of stay out of the kitchen. Okay, let's, let's do this. And you're also trying to divert them or provide an alternative to whatever is causing uh, the behavior that's making them aggressive or making or causing the aggressive behavior. Okay, next slide, please. For aggression during bathing, dressing, toileting, or eating, break the activity into simple steps, one or two directions at a time. Don't rush them, go at their pace. Slowly usually works best. Tell them what you're going to do before you do it, especially before touching them. Give simple choices. Change your routine to try something different. If not, if they're not allowed to go places, try hanging a fabric or sheets to hide doors or post do not enter sign. Now, one of the things that's worked because when people start to wander or if you have a wandering uh, person for whom you're caring, well, alarms on doors, uh, those kinds of things are very, very helpful, cameras, et cetera, but also covering up the door. Uh, there are there are poster size or even bigger door size um, poster like things that you can get that look like a bookcase. Uh, or may look like something else. But the idea is to, to, to camouflage a door because if they see that, they're not going to be apt to go out because they, they're not thinking about where a door was once positioned or located. What they see is something that's not like a door, so they know they can't go through it. Um, so you have to try things like that. Um, 
And that will make your life a lot easier and a lot less stressful as well. Limit or avoid alcohol and caffeine, um, especially for the person for whom you're caring. And you may want to think about it for you too. Um, we know that caffeine, um, and we know what caffeine does. Um, and alcohol, uh, when caring for some person, can kind of dull your ability uh, to be in tune, really in tune. Um, to what's going on with your loved one. Turn off noises, radio, TV, um, and even not talk on your cell phone or phone when you're trying to talk to them. Again, they can't process um, two or three things going on at one time, and it's just too much stimulation coming at them too, from too many directions. Stay away from noisy places like loud restaurants. We're trying now to uh, train restaurants. Um, we have done so with eight McDonald's um, stores so that they will know how to accommodate individuals who are living with Alzheimer's and their caregivers. Uh, we're also attempting to train um, management and cashiers and all in grocery stores banks, uh, all sectors of the community, so that when people recognize someone living with the disease, they will know how to handle them, which will also help to alleviate the caregiver's um, stress. One of our caregivers had adopted something. She put a sign on the back of her wallet and said, husband has, has Alzheimer's. Um, because when they went into stores together or went places together, he often started behaving in a way that, that other people reacted to in a negative manner. So what she would do when there were some situations that started to occur, she just put up her wallet, the side, the sign was on and it would, people see that and then they'd start to behave very differently. So these are the kinds of things that you as a caregiver will have to figure out and, and do just to try to help manage your life with your loved one, as well as managing theirs. So we're, we're working with restaurants to try and get them to have either special tables reserved, uh, special days or times reserved, where the lights are lower, noise levels are down, um, so that it's easier uh, and more accommodating for individuals living with cognitive uh, cognitive problems. Um, use brighter lights indoors, especially at night, so it's easier for them to see. But no flashing lights, that kind of thing, because that can just um, throw them off. Uh, the flashing lights, a lot of... Uh, uh, um, percussive kinds of sounds that is an irritant and it can, can uh, send them over the edge as well. Okay. So what to do if you think they might hurt someone? Okay. Here are a few things that might keep everyone safe. Keep dangerous things like anything that can inflict injury, like guns, knives, heavy objects. Attempt to distract them. Go for a walk, a snack. Music always helps request or ask for their help with something. If you can't calm them down, give them space, but make sure that that space is as safe as possible. Don't restrain a person unless it's necessary to keep everyone safe. Holding them back can only escalate the situation. If you must hold them back, ask someone, like a neighbor, to be ready to help if needed. And informing your neighbors that you have someone that may have problems from time to time and asking them if they would be willing to help you in certain situations, that may be a good idea. Um, but also for, for potential wanderers, uh, alerting your neighbors, get to know your neighbors because if your loved one starts to wonder, often it's the neighbor that alerts you. Um, so make sure that you have um, folks around you who can assist in the overall uh, safety and care of your loved one. 
Once the person is calm, check for cuts, bruises as necessary and, and treat them if necessary. But if it happens often, if this aggressive, uh, very aggressive behavior that may hurt themselves or someone else, consult a professional. Um, but also caregiver groups can be a huge, huge help. Okay, next slide, please. But in all of this, take care of yourself too. Very, very important. It's not easy to care for a person with Alzheimer's and it's normal to feel overwhelmed, isolated or sad. Let somebody know if you begin to feel depressed, anxious, exhausted, irritable or sad. Take good care of yourself and you can take better care of others. Caregivers of partners with Alzheimer's have a harder time. Stress, negative impacts on overall well-being is more likely and more and you're more unlikely to practice self-care. And so many times those of us who have cared for cared for or are caring for individuals living with Alzheimer's overlook our routine exams, overlook our health. So consequently, you read about healthcare providers becoming ill or dying before the one for whom they are caring because they generally don't take as good a care of, of themselves as they're taking of the person for whom they're caring. A survey of Alzheimer's caregivers found that they were more stressed, most stressed by financial strain. We know what a financial strain it is because there are so few financial supports to assist in the care of a person living with Alzheimer's. A fear that your loved one will get lost, that fear of them wandering and getting lost, or even if they're with you and you're in a store and you're looking at something to purchase and you turn around and they're not there where they go. And believe me, they can disappear in a split second. The effects on family vacations or other outings. If you take them with you, how will they behave? Will there be accommodations for them? I'm still going to be the caregiver if they're with me. So is this going to be a vacation for me? Um, or will I even be able to take, even think about taking a vacation? Are the financial strains so great that we can't afford a vacation? Um, or are the caregiving uh, constraints such that I cannot get away? Okay. Balancing family responsibilities for caring of loved ones, which is also a very, very difficult process, but you've got to find a way to do that especially if you still have a, a spouse at home. If you're taking care of a parent, but you still have a spouse, if you still have children at home, they deserve your time as well. So how do you manage it? How do you manage to take care of all of those people and yourself? And taking care of yourself first is primary. Also reducing time with family which I just talked about, um, that's stressful. Very, very stressful. And again, take care of yourself too. The financial strain may result from time and needs of loved one and can impact your ability to work, earn a living. Lost wages can result in a financial struggle. There's also a greater risk for mental health issues because of the strain that you're under. Research shows that Alzheimer's caregivers are more likely than other caregivers to have depression, anxiety, and a poor quality of life. There's a greater risk of high blood pressure, high blood sugar, weight gain or loss, and sleep disorders. Also, some research suggests that these caregivers are at greater risk themselves for cognitive decline and Alzheimer's. Caregivers at most risk for stress levels that impact their well-being are caring for persons with Alzheimer's many hours each day, 
living with the person for whom they are the caregiver. Next slide, please. But take care of yourself too, because these folks are also the ones that are more likely to have the problems are women, are older, are socially isolated, clinically depressed, have lower educational levels, inadequate coping skills, and have little, if any, help from family or friends. And isn't it amazing how the doting children or the doting grandchildren or doting nephews and nieces suddenly disappear when someone has to be cared for? Not all, I don't wanna make that a generalized statement, but many. And in most situations, you find that there's one person, one or two people in a family that end up with the responsibility of caring for this loved one. Okay, next slide, please. But self-care is the key. And things you can do to prevent the risk for health-related problems and boost your well-being. Healthy diet, important. If you have any health issues yourself that require a special diet, please pay attention to it. If you're diabetic, have hypertension, high cholesterol, heart disease, any of those things, kidney disease, please pay attention to the diets that your physicians give you. It's important. It's important for your overall health. Daily exercise is important. That helps you with your overall health, it helps physical and emotional health. Practicing gratitude. We often get into a posture of finding everything that's wrong, but there's always a blessing, no matter how difficult the situation. So try and find that sliver of light in that, in that experience or in that day. There's always, look for the blessing always. Sleep is important. We know what sleep does to the brain. So sleep is important for overall health. Staying connected with others. Talk to your friends. Make sure you have those connections. It's important for you, for your health, for your emotional and physical well-being. Set limits on what you can do. And we know that most caregivers want to be the super person. There's only so much you can do. You too have limits. There are only so many hours in the day. You only have so much energy. There's only so much you can do. So try and figure out how you can just parse it down to what's manageable and what you might be able to share with others. If you have children or grandchildren that can do certain things, enlist them and maybe not ask them or just wait for them to offer to do something, give them a call and say, I need you to do such and such. I need you to help on this day, this day, this day, from this time to this time. I mean, you know, set up situations like that. And if they say no, go to the next person. But let people know what you need. Regular breaks from caregiving. And again, this is back to letting people know what you need. It's important. You cannot do this 24 seven for years on end. You cannot, you have to have breaks. You must have breaks. Socialize with others. It's important for you away from the caregiving environment. Find ways to laugh often. Laughing is, laughter is one of the best elixirs that you can find. Um, it's important and it's healthy to do. It's important to take care of yourself even when the going is toughest. Get your annual physicals. Contact your doctor about any health concerns. Maintain the schedule for your regular health screenings. I talked about that earlier. Exercise, eat healthy foods you enjoy, brisk walks to lower your blood pressure, lose weight, increase energy levels, improve immune system, and reduce stress. 
Carve out time for hobbies or other activities that make you happy. If you enjoy playing games, spend a little time to, to, to play a game on your on your uh, on your phone or on your computer. Um, or do a crossword puzzle. Um, watch something on TV that you enjoy, but carve out some time for yourself. Something that makes you happy. Get help from experts like lawyers, accountants to help with necessary tasks and tasks you may not be familiar with. Because as a caregiver, you need to know and have in place all of the legal documents for the person from whom you're caring, as well as for yourself. And there are um, there's plenty of information available about what those documents are, like a will or a trust, um, advanced directives. Um, and there, there are a number of things that you need to have in place. And that's everybody needs to have those in place. But especially if you're caring for someone, those things need to have been in place. And do your family a favor and have those things in place for you in case something happens to you and you need care. Join a support group to learn techniques from others and to know you are not alone in your journey. Important. You are not alone. There are other people sharing the same experience as you. Uh, looks like that's the same one. Uh, next slide, please. Planning for the future. The CDC says that more than half of people caregiving for loved ones with Alzheimer's did so for four years or longer. And we know that people living with, long, with Alzheimer's with good care, some live 10, 15, 20 years. It's a long time to be a caregiver. It's important to be prepared in case your situation changes. Again, talk with your lawyers. Instructions for loved ones' care and yours in the event that something happens. Keep a notebook with important information, such as important phone numbers of family, health providers, neighbors that help, favorite foods, behaviors, etc., and share with family and friends. Elicit help from family to decide who will make decisions for your partner if you are unable to do so. Visit nursing homes and long-term health care facilities and record preferences in your notebook in the, in the event that this becomes necessary. Next slide. And to end, you are the most important person to you and to your partner. While doing all you can for your loved one, do not ignore you in the process and never forget Always remember the instructions given by flight attendants. Put your oxygen mask on first before you help others. You must care for yourself to be able to care for others. Be as important to yourself as you are to others. You are the most important person to you. Thank you so much. And if there are questions, comments, or concerns, Thank you. Have a blessed day. Thank you for joining. And our next session will be April the 11th. It's always the second Tuesday of the month, April 11th. It will be an in-person. It will be on self-care. And I don't know if any of you know Reverend Dr. Gentry. She will be doing that session. Thank you guys again. Have a blessed day and uh, let's stay connected.